adjust it. Is this okay? This is perfect. Do you need that or? Um, Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you all uh, so much for coming this morning and for um, having me. Uh, particularly, I would like to express my gratitude to His Grace Vaisheshika Prabhu and um, Shivas Pandit Prabhu uh, for uh, arranging this visit and inviting me to do this service for all of the Silicon Valley devotees. Um, as I was um, talking to him about how we should create the format of the seminar. Um, usually when I give a seminar in Jiva Goswami or philosophy, the devotees say, well, let's do multiple sessions, maybe one hour, one hour, 15 minutes. Uh, and I have to say, well, a little more time might be useful to go through it. And with Shiva's Pandit Prabhu, we, I had to keep saying, no, no, let's do it a little less, a little less. I said six hours, eight hours, would that be okay? Um, 15 hours, I said, I... <laughs> And uh, apparently, um, devotees here, thanks to uh, some excellent training from Vaishesha Kapu, have incredible listening stamina. Um, and um, from what he uh, describes, it's probably uh, it would outlive my own stamina to speak. So um, I'm going to try to serve you to the best of my ability. And um, hopefully, there'll be plenty of time for questions as well uh, as we uh, go through the the seminar. But before we start, uh, I wanted to begin with uh, singing uh, um, Shad Goswami Ashtaka uh, as a tribute to Srila Jiva Goswami, uh, whose appearance day it is uh, today. So, is this one? The volume is a little down. I will adjust the volume. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. That's good? Okay. Um, may I use the Midanga? Thank you. Krishna Kirtana Ganana Tana Paro Premam Ritam Bhonidhi Krishna Kirtana Dhira dhira jana priyo priya karo Nirmat saro pujito Shri Chaitanya Kripa Bharo Bhuvi Bhuvo Bharavahantarako Vande Rupa Sanatana Raghu Yuga Shri Jiva Gopalako Nana Shastra Vicharanaika Nipuno Sadharma Samsthapako Nana 
लोकाना हित कारिणो त्रिभुवने मौ शरण्या करो राधा कृष्ण पदार विंद भजना नंदे नमतालिको ओ वंदे रूप सनातनो रघु युग श्री जीव गोपाल श्री गौरांग गुणानुवर्णन विधो श्रद्धा समृद्धन तो पापो ताप निकृतनौतनुभृता गोविंद गृत आनंदाबुधिवर्धन कनिपुनो कैवल्य निस्तारको ओ वंदे रूप सनातनो रघु युगो श्री जीव गोपाल को वंदे तूर्णम शेष मंडलपति श्रेणी सदा तो भूवा दीन गणेश कौ करुणया कौपीन कंथाश्रित गोपी भावर सामृता तिलहरी कल्लोल मग्नो मोह वंदे रूप सनातनो रघु युगो श्री जीव गोपाल कूचत को किल हम ससार सगना किरणे मयूरा खुले हो नानारत्न निबद्ध मूल विटपा श्रीयुक्त वृंदावने
राधा कृष्ण महारणिशा प्रभज तो जीवार्थ दो यो मुदा ओ वंदे रूपासनाथ नो रघु युग श्री जीव गोपाल को संख्या पूर्वक नाम गान नति भी कालावसानी कृतो निद्राहार विहार का दिविजितो प्रत्यंत दीनो चयो राधा कृष्ण गुण स्मृति मधुरी माँ नंदेन सम्मोहित हो वंदे रूपसनाथ नो रघु युगो श्री जीव गोपाल को राधा कुंड तटे कलिंद तनया तीरे च वंशी वटे प्रेमोन्माधव साध शेष दशया ग्रस्त प्रमत् सदा ओ गायत च कदा हरेर्गुणवर भावा भूत मुदा हो वंदे रूपसनाथ नो रघु युग श्री जीव गोपाल को वंदे राधे ब्रज देवी के चलते हे नंद सुनो कुता श्री गोवर्धन कल्प पाद पतले कालिंदीवाने कुताघोषंताविति सर्व तो व्रजपुरे खेदैर महावे फलो वंदे 
Pasanathano Raghu Yugo Shri Jeeva Gopalako Vande Oh, Vande Rupa Sanatano Raghu Yugo Shri Jeeva Gopalako Vande Shri Shri Shad Goswami Ki Jai, Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. For, for months, actually, since uh, January, we've been planning to have His Grace Radhika Raman Prabhu here to speak to us about Srila Jiva Goswami. It's um, partly because uh, we're, we're eager to raise the vibration here at ISV to bring in those who are uh, deeply devoted and also knowledgeable in various subjects of Gaudi Vaishnavism because this is the main purpose of our organization to provide an atmosphere in which people can come and deeply imbibe the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and our whole Gaudiya Sampradaya and um, simply by sitting and hearing in the association of those who are deeply learned and devoted uh, one advances in devotional service. Anukramishirti. It's step by step and automatic for those who sincerely hear and listen. And we also have, over the years, developed a deep appreciation for His Grace Radhika Raman Prabhu, his uh, upbringing in, in a Christian conscious environment, and his subsequent dedication to studies of Srila Prabhupada's books, and his involvement in the greater world of education. And uh, very specifically today, his knowledge of Srila Jiva Goswami after writing his PhD dissertation about him uh, also coincides with the release of the brand new Tattva Sandarbha, which is the very important literature, the beginning of the Sat Sandarbha, which Prabhu will say more about today. And this uh, book was uh, <clears throat> translated and given commentary by it's Grace Gopi Paranadana Prabhu, who's no longer with us. There's only one more book I know that's coming out after this, the Lagu Bhagavatam Rita. But uh, this book is a gem. It's very important for all devotees. And we wanted to uh, bring the two together, Radhika Raman Prabhu and the, tef- and the release of this Tefa Sandarbha. So it feels very auspicious, like a very auspicious confluence today of, of, of events. So we've a very... Uh, heartily welcome to ISV, uh, hopefully as a, a beginning of a long series of, of talks and events, if we can entice him to come back. Uh, I mean, he just got here, but let's be particularly nice to him. And please give him a, a, a warm welcome. Also, with any uh, big spiritual event, for instance, when Shukadeva Goswami met Maharaj Prikshit, sages came from all over the universe. And such is the case today. Uh, somehow or other, we've attracted His Holiness Giridaj Swami. Who <laughs> And we thank all of you for taking the time out to come here and give one-pointed attention to, this, to these topics. It's a two-way 
process, the hearers and the chanters uh, together make it a successful event. And we also welcome all of you who have joined us online today. Uh, we're broadcasting here from the live studios of ISV. And we're particularly interested in uh, catering to all of you who are online. So if there's anything that we can do for you uh, that uh, we haven't done yet, please let us know. You can write us or email us, and we're eager to increase. Uh, if you'd like to text in at any time questions, comments, or you'd like to order a Tatva Sandarbha, which is going for $25 today, and there are a limited number of copies available through the BBT. We bought most of them, so you might as well get it now. It's at 408 203 2223. That's 408 203. What's that? Okay, then. Uh, It'll be displayed on your uh, screen. You can see it when you're watching on the internet. You can call that number to Shraddha Devi Dasi's uh, text number. She's there to receive all your live calls. The lines are open. Also, if you'd like to speak up in the class, that number is also available on ISKCONSiliconValley.com. You can be part of the class and speak up. We'll be able to hear you here and answer any of your questions. So now, without further delay, let's welcome His Grace, Radhika Raman Prabhu and the topic of the Satsandarbha and Jiva Goswami. Please. Uh, my humble obeisances to His Grace Vaisheshika Prabhu, Nirakula Mataji, and His Holiness Giriraj Maharaj, um, and to all the uh, devotees, um, many of whom are, are close friends, and I've seen many familiar faces. It's so wonderful to be back in Silicon Valley uh, and uh, to visit the new temple for the first time. Uh, it's um, really a privilege and, and, uh, and exemplary community you um, have here uh, that's, um, whose fame spreads far beyond the borders of Silicon Valley. So uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, before I tell you about the structure of the seminar and, and the, the course, um, uh, I want to begin straight away by telling you a story. Now, it's a story that you may have heard before from Chaitanya Charitamrita, but I think it makes a very, very important point for the purposes of our topic today. Uh, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was traveling all across uh, South India on his tour after taking sannyas, um, <coughs> he, uh, <coughs> uh, everyone he encountered would become overcome by love for Krishna. And as he met someone and gave them this seed of Krishna Prema, which quickly blossomed, uh, that person would go on and meet others and would similarly have this uh, contagious effect of giving them love for Krishna through the holy names. And then again, that person would meet someone else and they would go back to their villages and change the entire village. And in this way, uh, Mahaprabhu brought uh, what Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami calls a flood of Krishna Bhakti all over India. And um, despite the fact that Mah Mahaprabhu was so successful, there was one place in India that he was not, at least initially. Uh, and this place somehow withstood the contagious, intoxicating effects of Mahaprabhu's mercy. Uh, does anyone know what that one place was? Yeah, uh, Varanasi, Banaras. Uh, and do you know why, what the main reason for that immunity was uh, that Banaras had? Mayavad philosophy. Because of the fact that they were so influenced by the doctrine of non-dualism, the doctrine of impersonalism, uh, as taught by Shankaracharya, despite Mahaprabhu's going there personally, it apparently had no effect. And Mahaprabhu says there in a beautiful verse that I came here to sell the goods of love of God, and yet there are no buyers. And so I'm going to have to distribute these free uh, to relieve myself of this burden before I continue onward in my journey. And yet, despite free distribution, there were no takers even. <coughs> And so Mahaprabhu um, went on his way. He, would, he stopped in Banaras on his way to Vrindavan and didn't really mind, didn't pay too much attention, but continued on his journey. 
On his way back, however, his uh, disciples, his followers in, in uh, Banaras, Chandrasekhar Acharya and Tapan Mishra, they approached Mahaprabhu and said, Dear Lord, it's really, um, we, we realize the fact that these things don't affect you, they don't um, disturb you, uh, but they really disturb us. When we see the people of Banaras and the people we uh, hang out with um, laughing at you and uh, misunderstanding you and not respecting you, and what to speak of taking your message seriously. Uh, uh, can, this is so painful, can you please do something about this? We request you. And so Mahaprabhu agreed, and he instructed both of them to arrange a meeting with uh, the Brahmins and sannyasis of Banaras. Uh, the leader of these sannyasis was Prakashananda Saraswati. And he came with his thousand disciples, uh, sannyas disciples, and um, uh, Mahaprabhu also arrived at this common place. And we are told that Mahaprabhu completely transformed these uh, powerful Advaitan Mayavad sannyasis uh, through a combination of different techniques, including his uh, humility, including his beauty, and his philosophical argument. Now, how exactly that happened, and what Mahaprabhu did, and how we might follow in his example in our own activities of presenting Krishna consciousness are topics for later. But what I want to focus on is Prakashananda Saraswati's criticism. His criticism was quite straightforward. He said, sure, I actually understand the importance of chanting Krishna's names, and that's good. I'm not objecting to that. Uh, these people should be doing it. But you're a sannyasi, and sannyasis are meant to study Vedanta and become scholars, and that's what you should be doing with us. Why are you embarrassing all of us by jumping up and down on the streets like a bhavuka, he says, like a sentimentalist, and like a uh, you know, um, common uh, devotee? Uh, an, an emotionalist, a sentimentalist. Uh, this isn't right. Uh, this, this isn't good. Now, this criticism of devotees being um, sentimentalists, of having no real philosophical grounding, of just moving by the wave of cheap emotion, these are criticisms that, aren't, that weren't new at Mahaprabhu's time and certainly aren't new in our own time. Right? Anyone who becomes a devotee knows the experience of being told this by their family members or their close friends or someone uh, who tells them, we're really embarrassed that you're a devotee. Um, I mean, <laughs> the fact that you practice Krishna consciousness is fine, keep it to yourself, but out on the street with books, I mean, this is common salespeople do this. And you're jumping up and down on the streets in Sankirtan, this is really embarrassing. Uh, and could, could you not have joined a more uh, elite and, and refined organization that was more philosophically oriented? Uh, so this type of criticism, uh, Mahaprabhu silenced when he spoke to Prakashananda Saraswati, and they all became Mahaprabhu's followers. It worked very effectively. But that criticism returns generation after generation. To this day, if you read textbooks of Hinduism, uh, published by the top academic presses in the world, uh, and read by students all around the world, these will typically uh, have a section on Indian philosophy, which includes persons like Shankaracharya and Ramanujacharya and uh, Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda and so on. And then there'll be a section on saints and other such emotional figures. And Mahaprabhu will be included amongst them, often as an example of someone who was very dedicated to Krishna Bhakti but suffered from some form of epilepsy. And as a result was... Now, if there's no question that Mahaprabhu had the, the qualities of a great saint. And even if we appreciate him in that way, that's good. Uh, that is to our eternal benefit. But why is he not counted amongst the world's great philosophers? Why are his followers not counted amongst the world's great philosophers? Uh, given the fact 
that if you just look objectively at a, a relatively short history of 500 years, the amount of writing, the amount of um, uh, theologians and philosophers and scholarly devotees that our uh, movement, the Chaitanya Vaishnava movement has produced in these 500 years is unmatched in the history of India and uh, you know, perhaps we can venture further but whatever you can study from Indian history you realize that the density of uh, output and the quality of output is incomparable and uh, there's no reason why uh, both categories cannot hold of saint and scholar and philosopher and theologian and teacher, particularly for someone like Jiva Goswami, whose um, extraordinary abilities you'll, you'll hopefully see in this, uh, in this seminar. So that's the question, that's the problem that returns every generation. Mahaprabhu dealt with it then, but it comes back, and it will continue coming back. These are perennial questions, perennial problems that every devotee has to face uh, in the world. This is natural. And so we have to be prepared, we have to be equipped, we have to be convinced ourselves uh, also. And the one person who is essential, who's crucial in that role, whose life's writing was dedicated to this very purpose, of doing what Mahaprabhu did in that one instance. That person is Jiva Goswami. Uh, Mahaprabhu visited Banaras. He changed the people. He left. Again, Banaras has been a, a headquarters of all kinds of philosophical ideas. But do you know, just a couple decades later, who returned to Banaras uh, from our movement and spent some time there again engaging with these uh, philosophers? Srila Jiva Goswami, and he went again. But he went uh, with a different sort of approach. He went to Banaras to do what? Yeah, to study, to get an education, and to study all those philosophical systems that he would later on um, engage with. Some he would agree with, some he would utilize, some he would disagree with. Uh, but all those systems he would argue with and against and for, later on he went there, uh, he learned all of them, and then he left for Vrindavan. Just like Mahaprabhu did, right? with the purpose of making this argument solid once and for all, that Mahaprabhu's philosophy is grounded in a firm philosophical foundation. And that foundation, though often not visible, is essential to our practice and our movement. Just like the foundation of any building. It, it gets very little love and appreciation because we spent most of our time polishing what we see and what we can experience. But if that foundation beneath our feet is not solid, then the building crumbles. It will crumble sooner or later. That foundation, that philosophical foundation, is one that has been um, provided by Mahaprabhu and poured like the concrete. It, it's poured by... Srila uh, Jiva Goswami. It's been set by the Goswamis uh, according to the direction of Mahaprabhu, the, the mix that he's created to make this foundation very, very strong. And it's up to us to appreciate it, to use it, to be able to present it, to be convinced ourselves. Um, and that's, that's, um, that's hopefully what, uh, where you can start to appreciate the works of Srila uh, Jiva Goswami and, and the Goswamis in um, general. Uh, now, I had a, um, when I was studying uh, at Oxford, there was a um, teacher from India who came uh, to teach us spoken Sanskrit. Uh, I didn't get very far on the spoken Sanskrit uh, part, so if any of you speak Sanskrit, then I won't be able to, to speak with you. But uh, we did try for a week or so. He, his, so. his old seminar was for about two weeks. And we took that seminar and all of us, a group of us at Oxford. His name was Acharya Sanskritananda Hari. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was his, and uh, he, at, at the end of the week, he said, okay, now Radhikraman or Ravi, you've learned uh, uh, something from me. Why don't you tell me the story of the Ramayana in 
uh, Sanskrit. Okay, just you know the story. Just tell me in very simple terms what you can. Okay, as as kind of an exercise, a test of uh, spoken Sanskrit. So <clears throat> I began straight away uh, with something simple. Asi Raja Rama Nama. There was once a king named Rama. Dashrata Suto. He was the son of Dashrata. Bali. He was very very strong. And uh, uh, um, you know Tasya Bharya Sita. And his wife was Sita. And like this. So something simple. And I got two sentences in it and he stopped me right away. I said, no, no, no. I said, what, what happened? Did I say something grammatically wrong? He said, no, grammar was fine. He said, this is just not how you tell the story of the Ramayana. Now, I know the story of the Ramayana since I was a little kid, and I had not said anything wrong up to that point. So I asked him, well, how do you say the story of the Ramayana? What did I miss? You want me to start farther back? Um, and he said, no, it's the approach. This is not some ordinary story about, uh, you know, some adventure story or, or you know, Peter Pan and, and Wendy. This is not that kind of story. Um, this is a story about Lord Ramachandra. He is the supreme Lord. He's God himself. You have to start by glorifying him before you can expect to be able to tell his story. It's only by his mercy that you will be able to speak his story. And how will you gain that mercy unless you begin by glorifying him in the way that Valmiki Muni does and Tulsidas does and all the uh, speakers of the Ramayana do? And even though my spoken Sanskrit didn't go too far after that, I learned a very important lesson that day that I continue to remember in giving these seminars, is that when we begin studying any sort of subject, it is very important to, number one, know the source of that knowledge, and number two, to glorify the source of the knowledge before we can expect to get it. And if that source is not worthy of glorification, then there's no point in really studying it either, because the content, even though it might be accurate, is not going to be helpful for us. Now, we have a situation where we know both the source and the content are extraordinary. So I want to start this seminar by telling you a little bit about Jiva Goswami and how exceptional he was as a person, not just as a writer, but in many, many different ways. We'll talk about that, um, and then we'll move on to look at the Shatsandarbhas. And what I want to do is, instead of, uh, in the seminar, instead of going um, kind of uh, Sandarbha by Sandarbha, and within a Sandarbha, verse by verse, uh, which is certainly um, the way to do detailed study of the Sandarbhas, for the purpose of the seminar, I would like to present it more thematically. First of all, by looking at the Sandarbhas as a whole and saying, what is the strategy behind the Sandarbhas? What is Jiva Goswami trying to accomplish? And what is his strategy for actually accomplishing that? How does he go about doing it? And then I want to focus <coughs> on... Uh, once we discuss his strategy and how he does it, I want to look f particularly at Vedanta philosophy, uh, specifically um, how Jiva Goswami presents the idea of Achintya Bheda Bheda based on the Srimad Bhagavatam and uh, uh, how it relates to or how he argues for or against the other systems of Vedanta that were current during his time. Uh, and then finally, if we have time left over, then I will actually um, uh, show you some of the arguments that he's making. Uh, actually, we'll see several of them along the way. But several of the arguments he's making and how he's actually explaining uh, the first five sutras of uh, Vedanta Sutra. So, <clears throat> a warning straight ahead. This is a course on uh, philosophy. Okay. Um, I begin with a story, but it's misleading because there are not a lot of stories in this uh, seminar. Uh, in other words, it requires a lot of focus and a lot of um, willingness to engage with the material. If we simply sit there and allow the material to wash over us, then what you'll get is very, very little. In your mind, you have to be working at it. You have to be engaging with it. 
argue against what I say, what Jiva Goswami is saying, in your own mind, to see if it holds up. And if it doesn't, then ask questions. And then think of possible counter-arguments. Try to see how the logic is moving. And if you see a hole in the, in the logic, then think about it, question it, um, discuss it, because that's what's going to help you retain the material. It's not the type of thing that you can just absorb. In fact, very few subjects are like that. Uh, one has to engage with the material, but particularly for this, because it doesn't have a lot of the jazzy elements uh, that might be present in other sorts of discussions that I can spice it up with. But I can guarantee you one thing, that if you're invested in being a devotee and solidifying your faith, then there's nothing more exciting than this. It's really quite um, stunning, it's quite amazing when you see what Jiva Goswami is doing and uh, just how accomplished he is and how well he does it as well. So that's to start off with. Uh, any questions about the structure or what to expect in the, um, uh, in the seminar? I'm going to stop at various points to ask as explicitly for questions. If something is unclear, please feel free to raise your hand or um, for people online to to uh, however you do it, to ask questions in between if you like, but those questions I just request you that if they're in between, then they be for the purpose of clarification of the argument. I realize that when you're going through philosophical material that has uh, an argument to it, it's often difficult to wait till the end in order to clarify something that's unclear. And so that's why for this seminar, I do allow or open it up to questions even in the middle of it. And so feel free to raise your hand and say, this is not clear or whatever. But if there are other things you're interested in or directions you'd like to go in, which I would be happy to go in, but we're not discussing it then, then please wait until I pause for questions and then we can go, we can explore further in whatever areas uh, you would like. Okay? Yes. Uh, Prabhu, I just wanted to understand this uh, the suggestion that you just gave, you know, about argumenting. I mean, the mind anyway has a tendency, you know, to question a lot of things, you know, and think I am always right. Now, we are, you are going to teach us Jiva Goswami's Sandarbha and what exactly did you mean by argue on it? And, you know, I mean, what, what should be our mood? I mean, is it for our benefit so that we can go and deepen down because anyway that is a very tendency that I have which I want to avoid especially you know when it comes to teaching of such saints and to even think that okay yes. so what should be the mood? That's a good question and um, the idea is that in order to learn we have to question but we should go about it I would just modify a little bit what you said that we should uh, argue and question with the assumption that Jiva Goswami is always right, okay? So instead of thinking, oh, I am always right and let me question, let me question and argue against him with the assumption that he will be right, right? And so it's that combination of inquiry but also submission or humility that is the balance that we're striving for. And it's not always easy to get, but hopefully we can, you know, work on that art, okay? So, um, Jiva Goswami, uh, he was the son of uh, 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 Anupam Goswami, or Vallabha, uh, as he was named, uh, and the nephew of Rupa and Sanatan Goswami. Uh, Rupa and Sanatan Goswami were the leaders of their communities, Ashesh Mandalapati, during that time uh, in Bengal, which was one of the richest and most successful kingdoms in the world. It was, uh, it was really um, uh, uh, an empire with so much wealth and so much affluence. And as Dabir Khas and Sakra Malik, uh, they had um, you could say, two of the most important roles in the kingdom. One was basically as prime minister uh, uh, and the other as, um, as a finance minister or uh, uh, head of the treasury. And uh, these two, basically, you control the money, you control the kingdom, and if you control advice to the king, right, who is off on various sorts of military expeditions more than half the time, the Nawab, and so that leaves you in charge of running the kingdom. Uh, basically, uh, from what I could tell after a little bit of research, uh, Rupa Goswami was in a position that was uh, basically third down from the Nawab. 
So the second position after the Nawab was one that was actually a risky one for the Nawab because that number two position would often cause a coup for the Nawab himself and become the Nawab, right? So there was, it was a little too close for comfort. Number three was a little more comfortable, even though there were instances in history where number three became number one, but it was still a role of really helping out number one in his work. And so it's, um, it was a very, um, very prestigious position, Mandalapati. Jiva Goswami was born into that sort of family. And his father was actually present when Mahaprabhu instructed Rupa Goswami in Allahabad. He was there, he listened to the instructions. Uh, and um, unfortunately, on the way home, and we don't know exactly how, but he passed away, Jiva Goswami's father. And as a result, um, Jiva Goswami at that time was very young. We don't know how old exactly. Uh, <clears throat> he was uh, uh, a, a, a small child. And um, he grew up, of course, in a community of devotees, but very soon developed a sense of renunciation. And some sources say at the age of 12, others say at the age of 24. But Nevertheless, at some point, very early on in his youth, he decided to leave home and follow in the footsteps of his uncles, Rupa and Sanatan, who were already in Vrindavan, uh, um, fulfilling on the instruction of Mahaprabhu. Uh, but before he went to Vrindavan, he stopped in a couple of places. What's the first place he went to? Do you know? Uh, before he went to Varanasi, he went to Navadweep. And there in Navadweep, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur tells us that he received a, a tour of the places of Mahaprabhu's pastimes um, uh, from him. Uh, now, Mahaprabhu had already left the world by this time. Uh, and <clears throat> some say that Jiva Goswami never met Mahaprabhu. Others say that when Mahaprabhu came to Ramakeli uh, <clears throat> to meet Rupa and Sanatan, that Jiva was there as a little child uh, and accompanied them and in this way had Mahaprabhu's darshan. It's not entirely clear, uh, but any kind of exchange was not a direct exchange. Uh, Mahaprabhu didn't give him any direct instructions ever, uh, but instead he received the mercy of Nityananda Prabhu. Now, who could be a better tour guide for Navadvip than Nityananda Prabhu himself? And he took him from place to place and introduced him to just about all of Mahaprabhu's uh, intimate associates. I mean, they were all still there because Mahaprabhu left this world so young at the age of 48. He was, they were all still present. And so he had the opportunity to meet these amazing devotees and associates, get their blessings. And finally, then Nityananda Prabhu personally gave him the instruction that he had been hoping for, which is go to Vrindavan and join your uncles there. Now, Nityananda Prabhu is famous for giving this instruction and being very effective. What's the other famous example of him saying, go to Vrindavan where all things shall come to pass? Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami. So you can see the Lord and his devotees creating a, um, a vibrant community of Vaishnavas in Vrindavan for a great task. But before he goes to Vrindavan, as I mentioned before, he stops in one other place, that's Banaras, where he spends merely one year to learn all the six systems of philosophy. Now learning even one of these systems of philosophy in this course of a year is next to impossible. What to, doing, what to speak of doing all six. And this is not a theoretical idea either, because if you study the Sandarbhas, you see see that Jiva Goswami is deeply familiar with a whole host of different philosophical systems. It's not theoretical. In fact, when I was doing my, <clears throat> my uh, PhD work, which involved translating a section of Paramatma Sandarbha, the third one, uh, I kept encountering in Jiva Goswami's language this... Uh, he would use a lot of abstract nouns. So, uh, you know, uh, where he would say something in what seemed to me to be a very roundabout way and rather confusing way, uh, where, in, uh, to give you a simple example, so this is a chair. Uh, the abstract noun or the quality of chair would be chairness, right? So instead of saying, this is a chair, I could say, this object possesses the quality of chairness, which would convey the same information to you, but certainly very confusing. Uh, it seemed Jiva Goswami to me was doing this all the time. In very, this is a very simple sentence, but in very complicated situations, he would 
he would be he would be very fond of the suffix twa, uh, um, dasa twa. I mean, dasa means servant. Dasa twa means servitude or servantness, uh, or dasa ta. And he would use all these uh, abstract endings. And finally, in frustration, I went to um, a colleague of mine who was studying there also, a senior graduate student, not a devotee, He's, he'd been, I mean, very, very learned in Sanskrit. And I said, what's happening here? Why is he doing this? What kind of language is this? And he read it for a few minutes and he said, ah, this is clearly someone who's very well, well versed in the, in the area of Nyaya philosophy. It's one of the six darshanas, the six systems of philosophy, Indian logic. Uh, and it's particularly Navya Nyaya which displays these methods of speaking and writing for these reasons. In order to understand him properly, you're going to have to study Navya Nyaya and understand. And I, I never did go down that route uh, very far. Okay, some basic stuff, but that was about it. But I, I quickly realized that Jiva Goswami is the real thing. He's not just, you know, that we have a, he has a reputation around him for being very learned and this and that, and he mastered the 64 arts in 64 days, no one really could do that. that. There's no reason for that kind of skepticism, because when you read him, you see, this is the real thing. He knows this material. The other thing I quickly realized is that Jiva Goswami is not speaking uh, for me for us, actually. We are not his intended audience. His intended audience basically does not exist anymore. Maybe a few people in some places of South India. That's about it. Right? But the level of audience that he's speaking to um, is a learned audience of his time. And the learned audience of his time was a thousand times more learned than the learned audience of our own time when it comes to Shastra and comes to Sanskrit and so on. Like I said, maybe a few representatives left still. Uh, to give you an example, typically in his uh, commentary on the, uh, the first five sutras of Vedanta Sutra, if he wants to quote someone, uh, he will, like Ramanujacharya, he'll give the first few words of the required um, passage that he wants to quote, and the last few words, to kind of tell you where you need to begin and where you need to end, and then say, this proves the point I'm trying to make, and continue on with his argument. With the assumption that, obviously, if you're educated, you're going to know the Sri Bhashya and Shankaracharya Sharidaka Bhashya, and you're going to know this, and you're going to know that. Uh, that's, that's any learned person would know that. But of course, very few learned persons know those systems today. In fact, I remember one particular passage. It was just actually two sentences long. And I struggled and I struggled and I struggled with it the whole day trying to translate these two sentences. They said something very simple, actually, on the surface. They said that he was trying to argue that, in fact, um, uh, the uh, Lord Krishna or Vishnu is the speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam originally. And he said something, um, he said, well actually, I think it's one of the handouts I have here. I can... Here it is. So the concluding statement, that one. So, you'll get this handout in just a couple minutes, and um, here, uh, Jiva Goswami, there's this one sentence. Uh, let's see. So if you look down, uh, it says one, two, the third sentence. In the second interpretation, yeah, so in the second interpretation of Atma Grihitir Ittaravad Uttarat, found in Shankara's Brahma Sutra commentary, the referent of the word Sat, mentioned in the opening statement, is understood to be the Atma because the word Atma is present in the concluding statement. In the same way, here also the speaker of the four-verse Bhagavata is understood to be Bhagavan, and he who is revealed in the trance of Sri Vyasa is alone understood to be the object of meditation. 
So the speaker of Bhagavata is Bhagavan. How do we know this? Uh, well, it's simple. In the second interpretation of Atma Grihitir Itravat Uttarat, found in Shankara's Brahma Sutra commentary, the referent of the word Sat mentioned in the opening statement is understood to be the Atma because the word Atma is present in the concluding statement. Now, Jiva Goswami presents it like this, and then he says, therefore my point is proven. What does this actually mean? Well, in order to figure it out, I had to first of all figure out what Atma Grihitir Itravat Uttarat was, what that sutra is, and of course we did some research, found that sutra in Vedanta Sutra, tried to figure out what its generic meaning was. Now he says in the second interpretation of that sutra, I thought, I thought Shankarachai only wrote one commentary on Vedanta Sutra. Well, if it, tur it turns out that when you look at his commentary on that sutra, he actually gives two distinct commentaries. Okay, that figured out. Now you read the second commentary. He says the word sat is the word atma. Okay, so we look through it, found sat, found atma. Yes, indeed, he is uh, arguing that sat, namely the absolute truth, is atma, is the self. We are God. thought, what? Jiva Goswami, he's agreeing with that statement? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. But then if you look at it closely, what he's doing is not agreeing with that statement. He's saying the method that Shankaracharya uses to prove that sat equals atma, that method, when applied here in this context, proves that the speaker of the Bhagavatam is Bhagavan. Okay. Now, what was that method? I, I won't go into that now. But he uses a very interesting method of opening statement, concluding statement, using a system of argumentation called Mimamsa philosophy, which is also one of the six darshanas. Footnote number five, you can see, that's the outline of what, in order to explain one sentence, what I ended up writing in order to just explain that one sentence, footnote number five. It took a whole day's work. And the amazing thing I realized is Jiva Goswami assumed that you ought to be able to catch that as you're reading. It's like the, he assumed that his audience would go, oh yeah, the second interpretation to that sutra, of course, okay. <laughs> I remember what he does there, so let's put that together in this, okay, great. This is straightforward. This is actually one of the simplest um, uh, uh, arguments that Jiva Goswami is making. He, in other words, he doesn't spend much time on it. The opening statement instead of the concluding one, which we'll talk about later, that's actually much lengthier. So this is what I mean when I say that Jiva Goswami is not writing for us. He is writing for us in the sense that we'll see later. He's writing for the entire Sampradaya. But we have to work hard at getting what he's offering. And this is why we ought to be so grateful to uh, Srila Prabhupada and to Gopi Pranadhana Prabhu for presenting so much of what Jiva Goswami gives in a way that is actually meant for us as an audience. Um, as we'll see later on in this uh, seminar, that uh, we actually know much of the content of the Sandharvas. We don't realize we know it. And often we don't know it in a systematic fashion. So we can't make the argument itself. But the reason we know it is because the majority of it, Prabhupada has given in his Bhaktivedanta purports. He's actually given very, very clearly and meant for us as an audience, not for an audience 500 years ago. And written with examples that are suitable for our time, not for the people of 500 years ago. And that's the beauty of what Prabhupada has given. And hopefully some examples of this will be clear as we move forward. Okay. So, this is Jiva Goswami's um, erudition, you could say. Um, I want to say more about just how amazing he was as a writer. But before we go with that, um, it's important to mention that Jiva Goswami is famous for his writing, but that's not even half of what he accomplished as a devotee and as a... As a, as a um, key Acharya in our Sampradaya. means Jiva Goswami was a, a very well-rounded uh, personality. Not only was he a uh, great scholar, uh, which will become very clear in the course of the seminar, I hope, but he was also a great leader as well. Uh, 
you see, Jiva Goswami lived at a time in our movement's history that was very, um, a very, uh, uh, a, a a turning point, a, a milestone period in our tra transition period in the history of our Sampradaya for the simple reason that Mahaprabhu had just left. And when the Lord himself leaves, as we know from Bhagavatam, Krishna Swadhamo Pagate, or his great devotee leaves, an Acharya, like we know from the departure of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and the Gaudiya Mat, or his divine grace Srila Prabhupada and Iskon, it's a difficult time for those who are left behind and for the institution as a whole. Now, when Mahaprabhu left, we can imagine what kind of gap that left in the world. And particularly when the older Goswamis either gradually left this world or relinquished their responsibilities to uh, Jiva Goswami. Uh, this left a very um, significant responsibility on his shoulders, which was to make sure that the movement retained its uh, unity and its direction and its philosophical purity. Uh, in fact, we find that Jiva Goswami became uh, the undisputed leader of Gaudiya Vaishnavas on philosophical matters. And even in matters of organization, uh, historical records show that uh, uh, Mother Janava, Janava Devi, who was the leader of the Vaishnavas in Bengal after Nityananda Prabhu left this world, uh, she came on several occasions to Vrindavan, at least two we know of, uh, to meet Srila Jiva Goswami. And she was held in the greatest esteem and deference by Jiva Goswami, practically on the level of his own spiritual master or teacher. But at the same time, she received advice from Jiva Goswami on many practical matters about how to keep the cohesiveness and the unity of the movement in Bengal. And Jiva Goswami played a direct hand in this by sending his own disciples, Srinivas Acharya, Narottam Das Thakur, and Shamananda Pandit East to Bengal and Orissa to make sure the movement stayed together. Because so many potential misconceptions can arise. One of the big questions during this early period in our movement uh, was, who is Mahaprabhu? Who, who is he as an identity? Is he the, as an incarnation of Krishna? Is he Krishna himself? Is he Lord Vishnu come to destroy demons in this way? Or is he, what is he? And the conclusion, the final authorized conclusion that he is Radha and Krishna combined, Krishna with the mood and the complexion of Srimati Radharani that is presented by Krishnadas Kaviraj. This was inspired, it was guided by the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, as Kaviraj Goswami himself says in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So the point being that that um, there were so many such matters, this is just one of them, where the movement could have split in multi-directions, fun, found fundamental matters. And yet Jiva Goswami, by bringing together the works of the older Goswamis, writing his own, and sending them to Bengal, and keeping in touch with the movement basically as far as it had spread, its main centers, uh, which were Vrindavan and, and Bengal and Orissa, he ensured that the movement kept its cohesiveness and it had leadership uh, going through during this period. Period, this, um, this crucial period of history. So he was a great scholar, no doubt, but he was a great leader in being able to inspire people uh, 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 behind him. He was also an exceptional manager. Uh, now, I mean something more specific here with management in terms of actually dealing with the physical assets of our movement. Um, when the six goes, when Ma Jiva Goswami arrived in Vrindavan, uh, after studying his, after finishing his studies in Banaras, uh, he arrived there. He settled in, and you know the f what he started to work on, uh, what he started to do. What was his first engagement? Not editing, not writing. <laughs> he was serving as basically a busybody in the office. Means he was performing menial service for uh, his uncles as they were engaged in their wonderful work. He would prepare the palm leaves, he would clean up for them, he would fan them when necessary, he would shade them from the sun, all kinds of services in which he uh, practiced the Vaishnava virtue of service and humility. 
and endeared the Vaishnavas to him. So much so that within a very short a span of time, he became dear to all the Vaishnavas in the, um, in the uh, community of devotees in Vrindavan. And there's this wonderful story, which um, I won't tell now for the sake of time, but how one time when um, uh, Rupa Goswami is upset with him, uh, how the community of Vaishnavas gathers around him and speaks on his behalf to please uh, re-accept him within the community because they loved him so much. And particularly his uncles and the senior Goswamis, uh, so much so the evidence for that uh, is the fact that when they left this world, they left all of their assets to Jiva Goswami. Uh, Raghunath Das Goswami was famous for his library, which he kept at Radha Kunda. Uh, this was one of the best Gaudiya Vaishnav libraries uh, in, the, in the world at that time, and uh, particularly there in Vrindavan, that all the Goswamis used for their writing. He left that in the name of Srila Jiva Goswami. And after he passed away, those books were moved from Radha Kunda to the temple of Radha Damodar. This is why you find the Goswami Samadhis in the temple of Radha Damodar instead of their own temples. Um, it, it's a demonstration of the great love that the Goswamis held for, um, for Jiva, the youngest among them. And in fact, Srila Prabhupada uh, says in this very nice uh, um, quote, um, passage where he says that the Radha Damodar temple is the spiritual center of our movement because the Goswamis would gather there uh, on a regular basis to uh, plot the worldwide spread of our Krishna consciousness movement. Right? So this, is, this was the, the center. They would, despite the fact that all the temples were bigger, Madan Mohan's bigger, Govinda Dev was incredible, they would gather in Radha Damodar, which is frankly a very small temple in comparison, uh, just because they wanted to pass that mantle to Jiva Goswami, that you are the future, you're going to carry this on, our, all our blessings and our love are with you. Now, all these resources were left. By the way, those manuscripts were then moved from the Radha Damodar temple to the Vrindavan Research Institute, which is a government-run institution just down the road from the Krishna Balaram temple. And you can actually go there, uh, and they have uh, images of the handwriting of Srila Rupa Goswami, a couple of pages from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu left, and several other things related to the Goswamis. And some of these uh, manuscripts, if you look at them, they have stamped on there, the library of Raghunath Das Radha Kunda. Now, the stamps were put after the time of Raghunath Das Goswami, but the point is that the memory of where they came from is very clear. It's, it's a very clear chain of where these are coming from. So, the library, but the temples also. Now, think about the temples here. We've got the Govinda Dev Temple, which is um, the finest piece of architecture, and this is not just me speaking as a devotee trying to exaggerate. This is, this is a, a, a accepted uh, uh, by uh, anyone who's familiar with North Indian architecture, that this is one of the finest pieces of architecture in all of North India, uh, uh, the, the Govinda Dev Temple. And you can imagine when the entire thing was still standing, what it was, what it looked like. Then you had the Madan Mohan Temple, you had all these temples by the Goswamis with land and with resources for the service of the deity. What kind of political climate are these temples built in? What's happening in North India at that time? Anyone know? It's Mughal rule, right? So Akbar was living during the time of Jiva Goswami, okay, which is a fortunate period uh, in that history. But is it predictable what's going to happen in the future? In fact, the history of Braj is such that Vrindavan is located in a period, in a place in North India which is basically between Delhi and Agra, both places of political power for centuries. Vrindavan being a place of pilgrimage means it attracts temples, donations, lots of wonderful jewelry for the deities, a community of people, and whenever, whenever a ruler in any one of those cities decides that their treasury is diminishing, then there is some good reason to hold a raid on Vrindavan. And the armies come through, and temples are demolished, and uh, treasuries are emptied, and deities are hidden, are broken, and off they go. This happens again and again and again 
in Vrindavan's history much before the time of the Goswamis, starting at least a thousand years back. It's happening again and again. Vrindavan is destroyed, it's rebuilt, Mathura is destroyed, it's rebuilt, it's destroyed, it's rebuilt. Given that history, here we've got these beautiful temples. Right? And we live in the United States, we're very fortunate to live in a country where there's a lot of stability when it comes to property and when it comes to religious worship. So we build a temple, we expect it to be there for our kids. There's no such assumption that you could make at this time in India. Uh, in North India, especially in Vrindavan. Why is it the fact, why is it the case that 500 years later those temples are still standing for us to visit? There is no reason they should still be standing, given the, the scope of history. Why are they still there for us to visit? It's because of Jiva Goswami's extraordinary skills at managing these assets. He developed relationships with the leaders in uh, in Delhi, the Mughals, and he developed those relationships using an intermediary connection. The strongest uh, um, Hindu power at that time in that same region were the Rajputs, uh, who were ruling Mansing and so on, who were powerful enough that the Mughals decided better than trying to conquer them is to create treaties with them and to have them on our side. But they also served as spokespersons for uh, the Hindu communities, and felt themselves particularly protectors of Vrindavan. In fact, certain uh, 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 regions in, in the Rajput kingdom, the king would be called, one of his titles was uh, Braj Raj, uh, Suraj Mal in particular. Uh, he was um, uh, an, uh, a Rajput ch uh, chieftain. And he and he passed this title on of Braj Raj, means king of Braj. They, even though they had no official political dominion over there, they looked after it. So Jiva Goswami negotiated an agreement with Todar Mal and Suraj Mal in order, uh, signed by the Mughals in Delhi, Akbar in particular, uh, promising, guaranteeing that the temple of Govindadev, which was the most important one, would remain in the hands of Gaudiya Vaishnavas for all time to come. And here's how that leadership would be passed on. You can still go to, if you can get access to the state archives in Jaipur, you can see these documents actually present there. In fact, they've all been published and translated by one scholar. Um, it's uh, it's uh, an excellent resource for anyone who's interested in history. Uh, it's just basically a collection of all these edicts uh, called In Favor of Govindadev, uh, which is what would be written. In favor of Govindevji, here is what uh, we uh, bequeath, or here's what we promise. Now, uh, when these armies come through, we know soon after Akbar there was Aurangzeb, and the tide turned in terms of favor. The fa when these armies come, they come like madmen, morating and killing and fighting and pillaging, but they're not blind. They're not, even though it seems like that, they're not acting haphazardly. They're acting under direction. And this is why the Govindadev temple, despite being knocked down a few stories, still stands. Why Madan Mohan still stands. Why all these temples still stand. Because there were agreements in place that had to be honored from uh, uh, prior generations. Uh, and the temples remain preserved. So careful was he about this management aspect of our movement that besides making these agreements, Jiva Goswami wrote a will, a personal testament, his final testament, um, explaining how the worship at these temples should go on, particularly Govindadev, and how the ownership should be passed on. Uh, this will is the first example of a will that we have today. It's the earliest example we have today of a will in all of India. Which means that even if he wasn't the first person to write an official will, uh, we don't know, maybe others haven't lasted, but it was a very new legal instrument at that time. It was new technology, you could say. Not technology, but new legal instrument that was not widely used. Otherwise, it would be commonplace to have many before Jiva Goswami. It's a very historic thing that someone from our Sampradaya used a brand new legal instrument to ensure the future of the movement. And you can see this will or copy of it uh, there's even a little booklet that the Vrindavan Research Institute publishes uh, with the full copy and the full text of this. And at the bottom, you find the signature of all the great Vaishnavas of Vrindavan at that time. It's such a beautiful thing, actually. It makes your hair stand on end. When you see the names of people you've read about and you've heard, 
in writing their own signatures, it brings our movement and our people this close to us. You feel like you can almost touch that period. You can almost feel it, that we're right there. You know? So he was a great scholar, a great leader, a great manager, and finally, a great teacher uh, as well. Uh, he, um, uh, spiritual masters in our movement, from around our movement at that time, would send their disciples to Vrindavan, specifically to study under Jiva Goswami, to be trained in Vaishnav Shastra. And this was a commonplace thing. The three most famous that we all know about it was Srinivas Acharya, who was a disciple of... Um, uh, hmm? Gopal Bhatta Goswami, yes? Gopal Bhatta Goswami, uh, you had Narottam Das Thakur, and you had Shamananda Pandit. None of them disciples of Jiva Goswami, and yet all three as good as his disciples in terms of Shikshar instruction. They received instructions from him, they received titles from him upon completion of their education, and they received direction and service. Uh, Shamananda Pandit was practically single-handedly responsible for continuing the movement in Orissa through particularly his disciple Rasikananda Thakur, and also eventually to Assam, and then Narottam Das Thakur and Srinivas Acharya for Bengal and several regions of Bengal as well, uh, including converting the king of Birhampur, uh, Birhampur uh, or Vanavishnupur. So, um, in terms of teaching, uh, he was um, an excellent teacher and uh, inspired these devotees to go on uh, in their service after the completion of their education. Now, Look at this list here. A great scholar, a great leader, a great manager, a great teacher. Where in the world do you find a person with all of these qualities together? It's nearly impossible to think of such a person in art, to conceive of such a person. Usually those who are great scholars are terrible teachers. Um, <laughs> It's a fact. You can go to Harvard and you can go to Princeton and Yale and you'll be studying with a Nobel laureate and they won't know how to take the brilliance of their own minds and bring it down to a level where you and I can understand. Uh, similarly, those who are extraordinary teachers usually don't have a lot of time or interest for doing scholarly research that's on the cutting edge of their field. It's just a fact. Uh, as human beings, we're limited. Similarly, those who are great scholars, management, they don't always go well together. In fact, a lot of professors have a tough time managing their own lives, what to speak of the <laughs> lives of others. And so the absent-minded professor who walks past his own home, it may be a stereotype, but there's some truth in it as well. Um, Management is a skill that doesn't often go hand in hand with other skills on this list as well, right? We all have our strengths and then we get by in the other areas, basically. Jiva Goswami was a person who showed, just based on historical fact, what to speak of the glorification we could do uh, about him in terms of his devotion and his spiritual advancement, just based on historical fact, d demonstrated all four of these qualities in exceptional ways. Now, if you think of our history, there's one more person who comes to mind immediately when we look at this list of qualities as someone who carried all of these qualities together with him simultaneously. And that is uh, our own Srila Prabhupada who, if you look at his life and you look at his work, you see how he accomplished so much in every one of these categories that had he done just one of them well, he would have been an exceptional personality just for that. But with the translation and the commentaries that he wrote, which again I hope will be clear, you'll see some examples of how well he presents Jiva Goswami, that we ought never to think that we're not getting it from Srila Prabhupada. It's just that we don't often know how to extract it. We don't know it. We don't realize it. We don't appreciate it. So here's, uh, as a great scholar, all his work, as a great leader, the way he was able to inspire uh, hundreds of thousands of people and, and move them from place to place in the world and get them to do things they never thought they could ever do. You look at him, his skills in terms of management, as he did all of that and ran a global movement at the same time. And then his skill as a teacher, as he mentored his disciples, as he took them on morning walks, as he push them to think and to argue and to criticize and to be creative, that those types of qualities put together in a single individual. It's no coincidence that Srila Prabhupada began his 
mission to serve his spiritual master in the temple of Radha Damodar. That he sat there looking at the Goswami Samadhis, praying to the six Goswamis, began his life's work of Bhagavatam there at the temple of Radha Damodar. That is no coincidence. We have in him a living representative of Srila Jiva Goswami. So this is what I mean that we're not dealing with any ordinary person here when we speak of Jiva Goswami. Um, uh, by any standard. Uh, you can apply an academic standard, you can of course apply a spiritual standard, and you'll find Jiva Goswami uh, to be an extraordinary person. Now, let's pause here and see if there are any questions related particularly to what I just uh, talked about in terms of introducing him as a person. Uh, yes. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. When, uh, when you were just uh, explaining, I had this uh, small doubt. So when uh, you were seeing that you were translating what Jiva Goswami had written, and at one point of time you said that, oh no, this is not what Jiva Goswami might have thought, and then you went in and uh, redid the thing. So is, can I ask that, uh, is your upbringing as a devotee biased towards thinking that Jiva Goswami will probably write in this direction and not in that direction? Uh, definitely. I mean, I think uh, when we go in to study an author, we have to know enough about the background and the general context of the author in order to make educated guesses about where this is going to go. Uh, in other words, studying something cold is usually not a very effective st uh, study method anyway. Uh, study is all about uh, trying to discover what we don't know. And in order to do that, we need to know enough in order to make reasonably educated guesses. In other words, that this is the, the right path to go down, go down, even though I don't know it's going to work, just because I know he's a follower of Mahaprabhu, he's not likely to be arguing in this direction. Now, if it's the case that he's actually act, uh, arguing for Mayavad, it would become very clear reading on. But that was a sort of, you could say, a reasonable guess to make, that because he's a follower of Mahaprabhu, he's not going to be arguing for Mayavad. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, here. Are there any... I'm sure he's a spiritual personality, but having lost everything since his young age, um, is there any reference like how he came back and is it like inborn because he's a great um, personality? Like what are some of the difficulties that he went through in his life to as a person he was? Yes, that's a good question. Um, we know very little about Jiva Goswami's life because most of what we know about the lives of the Goswamis we know because they were involved in Mahaprabhu's life. And Mahaprabhu uh, devotees wrote so many biographies of him. Uh, but the Goswamis did not receive independent biographies or even partial biographies until a couple centuries later. Uh, in, even then the focus was usually on Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami. So we don't know a whole lot in terms of his life, particularly in terms of his inner life, um, uh, other than we know about through like Srinivas Acharya's Shad Goswami Ashtaka and other songs. But um, in, in general, the, the departure of his father instilled a great sense of renunciation in him. This is what we do know, that it, it created a sense of renunciation and a, and a desire to follow in the footsteps of his uncles, who became basically his fathers uh, upon the departure of his own father. Uh, but more than that, we don't, we don't know a whole lot in regard to Jiva Goswami. We know that he wrote his last will in um, 1605, I think, or maybe it's 1608. Uh, but that was the year in which he wrote his w will, and then a year later, that will was reconfirmed, as in there's a second set of signature at the bottom where Jiva Goswami writes, I reconfirm my will, and that reconfirmation was done uh, as just before he was ready to pass away, as a way of saying that will still holds. Because one writes one's will earlier on, and then it has to reconfirm later. So that was, I think, a year later. So we're talking 1605, 1606, something like that, is around the time of his departure from this world. But we know basic parameters and not a whole lot more besides that about his life. Um, yes, bro. You... You alluded to the fact that uh, you didn't want to get into the details of how Jiva Goswami temporarily was asked to kind of, you know, leave Vrindavan, but it would be nice if you can just tell the story, um, not only from the story itself, but also from the philosophical angle of it, why he did and why he challenged and stuff. Sure. Like that. I, can, I can try to say it as briefly as I can. 
actually, um, this story is, is in one sense very uh, important because it demonstrates something that we have to be aware of. Namely, Jiva Goswami is an object of criticism by those who are on the fringes of our movement, namely the Sahajiyas and other such uh, groups, who see him as someone far too dedicated to scholarship and argument and Shastric study to be a real follower of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because his real followers ha have to be Rasika Bhaktas who have no interest in study of Shastra at all, right? And they see these two things as in incompatible, that one could be a Rasika Bhakta and be very learned in Shastra. So they criticize him, and this story is told as a mode of criticism, basically, the time when Jiva Goswami was removed from Vrindavan. Uh, the the uh, great devotee Vallabha came to see, uh, Vallabha Chaya came to see Rupa Goswami, and as they were uh, discussing, Rupa Goswami said, will you kindly please hear the, um, uh, what I have to say about um, uh, Bhakti Rasa, the Bhakti Rasa Amrita Sindhu, which he was writing. In fact, Jiva Goswami, one of his earlier tasks was to ass assist um, uh, Rupa Goswami in editing the Bhakti Rasa Amrita Sindhu. Now, if any of you have experienced writing, one of the last things that a writer wants to have done is to have someone else meddle with your work. Now, we do send it off to editors, it's a fact, but then it comes back and the writer, it's a tug of war between the writer and the editor. No, that's, that's really what I wanted to say, and I don't care if it is, this is incomprehensible, that's how it should be said, and so on. So for Rupa Goswami to hand it to Jiva Goswami and say, you please edit, that's a significant show of um, a faith in Jiva Goswami. And in fact, Jiva Goswami, in one of the letters that he sent to Srinivas and Narottam, we have a record of this letter in Bhakti Ratnakara, he says that um, I, I'm sending the following books, but these ones are yet to come because I still need to edit them. Right? In other words, the editing process continued after this, their departure. Just as a sidebar, with all these questions about editing Prabhupada's books, this is a very important instance of how editing is handed to a disciple or a follower and continued after the departure of the, uh, of the teacher, of the author uh, uh, himself. Right? Um, and the forms of these works that we have today all um, have the editing, uh, have all been edited by Jiva Goswami. Those are the versions we have. We don't have any earlier versions of them. So anyway, Jiva Goswami, uh, Rupa Goswami was writing at that time and he reads this passage and one of the lines in the passage Vallabhacharya objects to. Uh, uh, the, the line uh, Vallabhacharya objects to was that uh, uh, the desire for liberation is like a witch in the heart. Mukti spriha pishachi, he says. Pishachi means witch. And Vallabhachai says, you know, I understand that bhakti is very important, but calling mukti a witch is a little <laughs> too severe, don't you think? I mean, it's a good thing to be liberated. And Rupa Goswami, in utmost humility, completely accepts, and he says, yes, uh, you are right, and I will change that. I will edit it. Now, Rupa, uh, Jiva Goswami is there, uh, fanning um, Rupa Goswami, and inside he's, okay, this isn't right. Uh, he, he misunderstood my, my guru, and I have, to, I have to fix this. And so when Vallabhacharya goes to take his bath in the Yamuna, uh, Jiva Goswami goes to assist him uh, with his clothing and other things, and when he finishes his bath, he says, may I please uh, submit a humble request. I have a few words to say about your discussion with uh, Rupa Goswami. And Vallabha says, of course, please say, your fame is already starting to spread and I wanted to talk to you anyway. And he says, I want to point out that what he called a witch was the desire for mukti, not mukti itself. Mukti spriha pishachi. Spriha. It's a desire which is a witch. Mukti, of course, is wonderful. She's a servant of the Lord. But the desire for anything other than bhakti is going to be, it's going to function like a witch in the heart. And Vallabha was so impressed by this that he went back to Rupa Goswami with the desire to praise his disciple Jiva. But after Vallabhacharya left, Rupa Goswami instead got upset at him and said, you have no control over your anger and you have no control over your pride and therefore you do not deserve to live in Vrindavan. Please leave immediately. Now, 
This is a heavy, heavy, heavy statement. Um, anyway, I'll continue the story and then I'll tell you what we can gain from it. But he, he leaves, he goes to Mathura and lives there in an alligator hole. This is what I've heard. Now, I, I don't know if alligators make holes, so I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it, he, he stayed on the bank of the Yamuna in, in a cave of some sort. And quickly word spread that there was this beautiful young Goswami present there, let's help him out. And people brought food and everything. But he was in a, in, in a mode of great repentance. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, this may have been a productive time for him also, uh, where this is basically in terms of uh, exact years, and I'm forgetting the dates now, but this is approximately the time that he began working on the Sandarbhas, which was one of his earliest works. So it's it's possible that he began his contemplation on the Sandarbhas during this same period. We don't know. Uh, after some time, the devotees in Vrindavan felt so upset about Jiva Goswami's departure that they went to Sanatan Goswami, who is the eldest of all the Vaishnavas in Vrindavan. And really, dhira, dhira, jana, priyo, priya, karo. They were functioning as guides and, and mentors for the people of Vrindavan village. So the devotees went to him and said, please find some way of bringing Jiva back. And so Sanatan Goswami went to Rupa and he said, uh, my dear Rupa, uh, you are not following one of the instructions you received from Mahaprabhu. And Rupa Goswami says, what? Uh, which one? Please tell me, I'll correct myself immediately. And he says, no, you go through them and when you come to the right one, I'll let you know. And so he comes to the statement, Mahaprabhu's statement, um, where he says, Jibe doya Krishna naam sarva dharma sar. The essence of all religion is Krishna's holy names and compassion to Jiva. <laughs> and he says, <laughs> and so he says, uh, um, that that's the one. And Rupa Goswami smiles and he says, okay, okay, you're right. Please uh, let him come back. Now, this story demonstrates perfect Vaishnav relationships in every way. Okay? Even though Jiva Goswami gets criticized uh, for this story. See, uh, he's not acting properly. In fact, everyone in this story was acting perfectly. Rupa Goswami in teaching his disciple. The spiritual master sometimes offers chastisement to the disciple even when one might think that, oh, it's not justified in this particular situation because there may be a deeper need for it that he knows, okay, for the good of the disciple. So Rupa Goswami was not playing an unusual role in sending Jiva away for some time. The second thing was that Jiva Goswami himself, by defending his spiritual master, did not do anything wrong. In fact, he did exactly what he should have done. He was respectful, he was kind, he was appropriate in his language, he was humble, and yet he was clear about where his spiritual master and how he could be defended. He didn't go up to him and start shouting and screaming and misbehaving. <laughs> he did it in the right way, but he offered defense in the way that we have a responsibility to defend Srila Prabhupada and defend and our acharyas and so on. There was nothing wrong with that. Now, when he was chastised by his spiritual master, what's even more impressive is the way he accepted that. He could have said, Guru Maharaj, you know, scripture says that I'm supposed to be defending you here. There's nothing wrong I did. But he didn't. He just left. He went. Right? In the same way, when Sanatan Goswami was approached, as a senior most devotee, he really had a role, a responsibility to look after the welfare and the well-being of the devotees. And when needed, he uh, fulfilled that role by going to Rupa Goswami. And then Rupa Goswami, when being told that he's not following Mahaprabhu's instructions, can you imagine someone living under a different tree every night, practically not eating and sleeping, seeing Krishna's pastimes in front of his eyes and writing them down in the works uh, in these Bhakti Samhita Sindhu and others, that person being told you're not following Mahaprabhu's instructions, that's, I mean, that's reason for some indig offense. offense in, you know, upset. No, look, I... What, what do you mean I'm not following? But even he acted with total humility and said, yes, of course, what is it, where have I gone wrong? Please tell me. A and did not feel at all upset, humiliated in calling him back. No, I'm going to stick to my point. This is, this is, this is what I said. I, once I've said it, I'll never take it back. And there, there was no ego there involved in that. I defend you from Facebook. 
Hmm? Yes, I'll defend you <laughs> from Facebook, exactly. None of that was there, right? There was no ego at play in any of these relationships that were present. Right? So, um, a wonderful example, actually, of how Vaishnava relationships worked in Vrindavan, um, far from being a reason for criticism. Okay, so that was a long answer to your question. Um, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for such a powerful seminar. We're just relishing it. There are around 83 people online currently. And uh, out of curiosity, I had this question that, uh, is there any kind of account of uh, Jeeva Goswami is meeting uh, Mirabai? Um, yes, uh, there is a story of this, of Jiva Goswami meeting Mirabai, that's told often in Rindavan, although as far as I know that story is not attested in our own literature. I may be wrong about this, uh, but as far as I know it's not present in Bhakti Ratnakar or other uh, such literature. So, I can't really say. It means it may be historically accurate, it may not be. Uh, Maharaj, do you know? Okay, thank you so much, Janvat uh, Giriraj Maharaj has more to say about this. Oh, well, so, someone brought that story up to Srila Prabhupada, that Jiva Goswami refused to meet her because she was a woman, and she said that I thought that in Vrindavan we're all female and right. Krishna's the only male. Srila Prabhupada said it may not be true, because in our line the Acharyas do not refuse to meet women. Mm. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Um, yeah, so there we have it. Actually, we have to be very careful in stories that circulate about Jiva Goswami. Uh, simply for the general reason, you may hear other stories also that I've not heard before that, you know, um, we have to be very careful just because Jiva Goswami is the target of criticism by Sahajiyas, um, simply because they see him as, um, uh, you know, kind of going against what their whole point is, which is that Mahaprabhu and his real devotees were all um, sahajiyas. So, uh, yes. Uh, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, I think this powerful seminar has just begun. <laughs> so I wanted to ask that um, you mentioned about the great qualities as a manager and a leader, and he sending different uh, his you know students to various places, Orissa, Banaras. Are there any records of Jiva Goswami himself traveling, say to? Rajasthan or other areas? That's a good question. Not that I know of. In fact, the six Goswamis altogether uh, really didn't travel once they went to Vrindavan. Uh, and I think that was part of their spiritual practice and following the instructions of Mahaprabhu where he said, stay in Vrindavan. And, and he gave them the instruction of writing Vaishnava literature, of uh, unearthing the places of Krishna's pastimes. And there's actually a third instruction in... Um, in the um, in uh, Chaitanya Bhagavat, which is to collect uh, um, a library of Vaishnava literature, which they did also exceptionally well. Um, any other questions online? Um, yes, Prabhu. So, just I wanted to know about the definition of Sandarva, if you can explain what. Yes. I think that uh, serves as a call to keep moving because that was exactly where we're heading next. Yes. Um, so, um, let's uh, go for another 15 minutes and then we, I think we break for uh, Guru Puja and other things. So, uh, let's now return to this, okay, which is where we're going to stay pretty much for the rest of the seminar, is the Sandarbhas and Jiva Goswami's philosophical presentation of Krishna consciousness. Now, um, a bit more to say about this. Jiva Goswami wrote a total of at least 25 different works uh, in four different categories, okay, four four categories. Well, we can, I mean, theoretically we can divide them in categories. He didn't make categories. But four different types of literature that he wrote. Uh, the categories are as follows. Um, uh, first is commentaries on other works. Perhaps his most original commentary is the Durgama Sangamani, which is his commentary on Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. In fact, this passage, the, this story that I told you about um, him be, uh, leaving Vrindavan Vallabha, 
in this commentary, he provides the alternate reading that Rupa Goswami suggested for that one line, Bhakti Supriha Pasachi, as an acknowledgement to his spiritual master's desire uh, to change that because of Vallabha. So um, uh, you, you actually find the, the variation present there in the commentary. But also he wrote a commentary on, on Bhagavatam called Krama Sandarbha uh, and others as well. So commentaries is the first category. Uh, the second is... Um, uh, philosophical works, and the most famous example of this is the Shat Sandarbhas. Uh, the third uh, category is um, uh, literary works. So by literary I mean like uh, Leela type works, which are um, uh, like Gopala Champu. Okay? Uh, he um, he wrote several such uh, wonderful, and Madhava Mahotsava and other such works. So these are focused on Leela, of course, with lots of philosophical content, but the structure is different than the Sandarbhas. And then the fourth category are manuals. Uh, these are manuals where they're manuals for doing certain things, like Krishna Janmatiti Vidhi, how to celebrate Janmashtami, or Harinama Amrita Vyakaran is the most famous one, which is uh, Jiva Goswami's Sanskrit grammar, where he uses Krishna's holy names in order to teach the rules of Panini's uh, Sanskrit grammar. So Panini basically, he teaches grammar by giving, creating little words that are basically don't have any meaning in and of themselves to refer to grammatical forms or structures. So the past tense will be called this and the present tense this. And so they're kind of meaningless phrases, lot, lit, lung. So when you read Panini Sutras, then you have this these strings of basically meaningless words that he has created for this purpose, lat, ling, lung, like that. And Jiva Goswami says, instead of saying such words, why don't we change each one of these words for Krishna's names? And we use one name of Krishna to refer to a specific uh, form of grammar. And so that results in the wonderful experience of many of these sutras, in fact, most of them having double meanings, where uh, the, uh, it has a grammatical sense and it has a spiritual sense uh, um, too. Just like one example, he says, samsarasya haras chiti, uh, which means that at the end of a word, when you have the suffix chi, then that uh, suffix disappears within this particular situation. Okay, but what it also means is samsara siya haras chiti. When there is chit or spiritual knowledge arising in the heart, samsara haras. Then samsara is finished. It's taken taken away. Uh, and uh, other beautiful examples of Krishna's names and everything being combined. Uh, the short vowels, uh, i, u, r, are called. Can you guess? Which form of Krishna is short? Vamana, right? And then the longer versions of those same vowels, a, e, u, r, are called Trivikrama. Because when Vamana is little, dwarf, right? Trivikrama is when he became very tall and took those three steps. So same person, same identity, but uh, longer. And then um, the, uh, the vowels are called Sarveshwara or the rulers of everything, because vowels hold the key to pronunciation in any syllable. And the consonant is dependent upon a vowel. So if I ask you to say the letter A, you could say it, A, uh, right? Or A or A. Uh. But if I ask you to pronounce just the letter K with no vowel sound, you can't. You have to say K. Right? So consonants depend on vowels. So the vowels are called Sarveshwara and the consonants are called Vishnu Jana or the devotees of Lord Vishnu, the followers of Vishnu. Okay? Like this, it's beautiful. The whole thing makes theological sense and uh, grammatical sense, of course, as well. Also, I should mention that Jiva Goswami wrote a manual called the Samanya Champu Lakshana, where he it provides a, a guide for a literary guide for writing literature in the genre of Champu and the style of Champu writing. Now, he wrote Gopala Champu. Champu is basically a combination of prose and poetry, where you mix the two together, just like Bhagavad Gita is all poetry. 
And if you read the Sandarbhas, what Jiva Goswami writes there is 90% prose. But when you got to have a literary work where prose and poetry are combined, verse and regular writing, that's called Champu. Now, Champu literature did exist prior to Jiva Goswami, but in a very, very minimalistic form, as a very sort of uh, just a workhorse sort of style of writing, which was used to produce a lot of texts that didn't have much literary merit to them. Jiva Goswami really raised Champu literature writing to the level of literary writing, where it became a very honorable and much used form of Sanskrit writing after him. And for that purpose, realizing that he did this, he wrote a guide for writers of Champu literature called Chamanya, Samanya Champu Lakshana. So in other words, it kind of gives you an idea at the level of literary accomplishment he was working at, where he wasn't just writing, like on the side, he would write guidebooks for anyone, even those who are not devotees, to write a certain style of literature, just because he basically founded that mode of writing himself. Uh, so four different categories, 25 different works in these categories. Now, this is a, a wide breadth of writing. I had these four categories, which in themselves, great scholar, great teacher, were very, very broad. But even in the area of great scholar, there you'd be hard-pressed to find a scholar who writes even two of the categories in one type of genre of writing, just because it's so difficult to master even one of these categories of writing, this style. Those who write great commentaries tend not to write Leela literature, and those who write Leela literature tend not to write manuals of writing and so on. So he showed incredible uh, um, breadth in terms of his literary abilities. That breadth, though, however, does not compromise depth at all. And um, hopefully that one example I gave you, which you have in front of you still, the concluding statement, demonstrates just how much depth is present there. But just let me give you one more example of this from my own experience, which is that um, when, of these 25 different works in four categories, um, one of these is the Shat Sandarbha, even though it's called Six Sandarbhas, it counts as one in this category. And that one work is what I um, uh, decided to do my PhD work on, uh, but not on the Sandarbhas as a whole because they are far too va vast to work on for just one PhD thesis. And so I focused on the Paramatma Sandarbha. Of the 25 books, one book, which has six parts, I focused on the third part. And of the third part, that has 105 Anuchedas or chapters in it. And I focused on just one chapter out of those. And of that chapter, I only focused on part of that one chapter. And it was enough to get a PhD at Oxford University. <laughs> now, just imagine, just imagine how many PhDs could be produced on Jiva Goswami's works, uh, how much depth there is present if you're going to unpack. I, when I started studying Jiva Goswami, I had read these statements from Prabhupada saying he is the greatest philosopher in the world, he's the greatest scholar of Srimad Bhagavatam, and frankly, I'll be really honest, I thought, I'm sure he's an amazing scholar, philosopher, and so on. But there's also some pious exaggeration here involved, because we're in his sampradaya and so on. That's understandable. But after studying Jiva Goswami, there was no doubt in my mind that the person I was dealing with was all of these things. That there was no question that we're dealing with the greatest of so many things, as hopefully you've seen in this uh, first part of uh, the seminar today. So this is our glorification of Jiva Goswami. Uh, we will stop here at this point, actually a few minutes early, because I think this is a good point to stop at. And then in the second part of the seminar, after this hour-long break, uh, we will uh, dive into the Sundarbhas um, directly, uh, talk about what they mean and their overall structure and Jiva Goswami's strategy in the Sundarbhas. What is he trying to accomplish and how does he accomplish it? Okay. Thank you very much for attending and listening so attentively, and I look forward to seeing all of you again after the break. So is it Sanskrit or Bengali or which language, this 25? Uh, Sanskrit. All, all Sanskrit. Sanskrit. Jiva Goswami wrote all in Sanskrit. Thank you. Thank you to Radhika Raman Prabhu for this breathtaking presentation. Please stay tuned for the next part, which starts at... 
11.30. Now we're going to have Prashadam. So we get all this and Prashadam too. <laughs> this is just like, I think we've already gone back to Godhead. So I, I want to mention also that today we have a, a very special presentation which corresponds with this outstanding presentation and that is we're offering the Tattva Sandarbha. Don't look elsewhere, we already bought them all, we've cornered the market. <laughs> you can order them here, they're $25, a small price to pay. This is an outstanding, beautiful book that you can read over and over again and you'll ne barely scratch the surface. We read the whole book um, uh, with close reading in Vrindavan last year and I felt like uh, I, I was able to retain about two or three percent. Needs to be gone through many, many times. This is a, a historical event. It's the extension of the Sampradaya in that Prabhupada came uh, and gave us profound teachings that will last for thousands and thousands of years. And he also empowered disciples that could do uh, works that would uh, <coughs> illuminate the teachings of the great Acharyas. This is uh, part of the glory of Srila Prabhupada, and one of the most glorious aspects that he was able to empower, attract and empower others to, to do such a thing. So uh, put this in your library, uh, refer to it if you'd like to, uh, to read it. Uh, you, you, your life will change dramatically. You'll, you'll get greater insight into Srila Prabhupada's works and so forth. Uh, we have one hand going up. How many copies is that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Shivas? Or two or three PhDs at least, just from this one book. Uh, even from the, the, the last part, which is called the Sarva Sambhadani, yes. which uh, I have to admit I couldn't uh, understand at all, although we read the whole thing out of respect for Jiva Goswami. So this, uh, this is available, $25. Please text in. Uh, uh, okay, take a list. Srivas Panda Prabhu. Okay, uh, come on up here and uh, uh, g give me a hand. Uh, yeah, you call out the names of everyone who's taking, and uh, Malini will write them down. Yeah. Okay, Srivas Panda Prabhu, Sudip Prabhu, uh, Kamishwari Mataji, four copies. Okay, go in Charan Prabhu, four copies. Mataji, am I saying too fast? Yes, also indicate how many copies you want. Yeah. Go in the Charan Prabhu, four copy. Kameshwari Mataji, one copy. Oh. Shushil Prabhu, how many? One copy. Oh, oh Shraddha Mataji has some online message. Aditi Mataji, three copies from Portland. Uh, sorry, Folsom. Yeah, Kamal Radhika Mataji, one copy. Sorry, Mataji. Sadhana Mataji, one copy. Oh, six copies online this morning. <clears throat> you may want to give the name to Malini Mataji. Vrindan Priya Prabhu, one copy. Prashant Prabhu, how many? Five? One copy. <laughs> Mayapur Bihari Das, one copy. Okay. <clears throat> I think the, the devotees who are on the internet deserve a chance before they're all gone. This, this could be a disaster. The online um, devotees who bought are Asit from Folsom, Loka Dakshaya Prabhu, Bhakta Bill, Bhaktin Kathleen, uh, Prabash, um, Hansapriya Mataji the other day, and Nilesh Prabhu. Yeah, yeah. So if you need a copy, just text six five zero two four five seven zero one eight, and please remember to put your name and email as well so that we can follow up. Once again, the number is six five zero two four five seven zero one eight, and there's an order from Sharad Kumar for one copy. Our operators are standing by to take your calls. Please keep those texts coming in. <laughs> Balram Chandra Prabhu, one copy. One copy, please. Who is that? Radha Venkat, one copy. Oh, Radha Venkat Prabhu from Sacramento, one copy. Balram Chandra Prabhu, one. Balram Chandra Prabhu, one copy. Uh, Prabhuji, one copy. Yeah. And two more copy. Shiv uh, Kumar Prabhu, one copy. Shri Kumar Prabhu, one copy. Radha Venkat Prabhu from Sacramento, one copy. 
Oh, uh, Hitin. I'll dar Prabhu one copy. Two copies. Yeah. Two copies, yeah. We have Rajin, some online. Ra, yeah, Rajendra Nandan Das um, called and he wants one copy. Rajendra Nandan Das. Rajendra Nandan Das. Uh, yeah, I think Jagrini Mataji also wants. Hare Krishna, Jagrini Mataji. We'll be running out. Okay. Jagrini Mataji, one copy, please. The number again to call in? 650 245. 7018, the number is on your screen. Please go to your telephone now and dial in. <laughs> Get the tons of tons that this is a historic event. And not to be taken lightly, although we take everything lightly these days because there's an abundance of books everywhere and you think, oh, book's just a book. This book came from Jiva Goswami 500 years ago. It's actually a miracle that I'm holding it in my hand. The miracle that occurred was that the, the Srila Prabhupada brought this tradition across the ocean empowered one of his disciples to illuminate the teachings of Jiva Goswami in such an exemplary way in accordance with the uh, Parampara teachings. And now, it, actually, the very fact that we're able to deliver it in the form of a book is a miracle in and of itself. We take air travel for granted, get on the plane, if it's five minutes late, we, th we think, oh, this is horrible. But the very fact that we could actually sit on a, a metal structure and fly through the air is amazing. And the fact that we have books Palm leaves were the medium of exchange for knowledge previously. It's very difficult by hand. This is a window of opportunity. Get this book, put it in your home, pass it down to the many generations that come behind you. This will change the world. Please order now. Order in multiples. Thank you very much. More. So, Shalat Kumar, one copy. And um, Dharmendra Prabhu, one copy. And he wants to know how he should pay. So that's something you should address. And Shankaranand Das Prabhu, one copy. I think you already had that. And then Shankaranand Das Prabhu. And Loka Prabhu, you already have, right? You already have his name, yeah. And Ramohan Prabhu from Boston, he wants two copies, actually. He has Sadiq Prabhu here. Three more copies. Sudeep, three more copies. Uh, Malini, come on up here and tell them how they can pay. Hare Krishna. Those who actually bought online, they can actually text their email addresses to Shraddha Mataji at 650-245-7018. And then we'll send you a link where you can actually pay online. Uh, we'll send you the PayPal information. And then we'll also... Uh, ship you that book. Um, maybe a minimal cost for shipping, or we will see if we can get free shipping if possible. And Sudeep will be taking the payments from the devotees from Sacramento. And shipping will be uh, handled by our local bullet cart. We'll <laughs> Padma Gopika Mataji, two copies. She's from Boston. Padma Gopika Mataji, she has, yeah, I have an email. Um, Sharad Kumar said he likes the lecture so much that he's coming into the temple to attend the rest of it. <laughs> Mataji, we have Abhijit Prabhu out here, one copy. Oh, Rajesh Prabhu, one more copy. Keep in mind that the holiday season is coming up. And if you'd like to surprise your friends and relatives with an a unusual a book, get them the Tatva Sandarbha. It will be, be a fodder for discussion around the uh, holiday table about phonemes and how uh, the uh, sound vibration is passed down from the spiritual world, enters the material world, and into the heart of the living entities. Uh, what is the epistemology? How do we know what we know is valid? And so forth. This is the foundational part of our Sampradaya, this book. So please get as many as you can and spread them out all over the country. We also want to support the Sanskrit school in Vrindavan who are uh, painstakingly producing these literatures. Not easy life. They're leaving, living there constantly in Vrindavan and, con and concentrating on translating these books in a pristine manner so that it can be presented to the world 
And uh, we want to have this end uh, very productive. That means this end means the, the demand end. When there's a huge demand for these books and they're going out everywhere, they'll be encouraged to, to make more books, which was also the desire of Srila Prabhupada to continue uh, translating and have the BBT produce other books from the Goswamis. Last orders, we have a couple minutes left because we do have to have nourishment to keep going. Go ahead. So I have Chuck Prabhu who wants to have one. He's going to send Chuck, Chuck or Charles. Thank you, Chuck um, and Charles. And there's one more um, from Neil Mani, one copy. Neil Mani Ki Jai. <laughs> and there's, there's one more. Um, So she wants one copy. The, uh, her iPhone is overheating. So many texts are coming in. Her hands are yeah. slightly burned. I can see that. There's smoke coming out. Please keep the texts coming in. Somehow or other. Get her some gloves from the kitchen. <laughs> mitts. We need some mitts need some to mitts. handle this. Exactly. Yeah. Tattva Sandarbha, Jiva Goswami. And Ekashri Shakti. Ekashri Shakti, one copy. Ekashri Shakti. I assure you the commentary, too, is... Uh, is extremely uh, deep, and uh, you'll notice the um, fact that uh, Gopi Paranadana Prabhu is absolutely faithful to the teachings of Srila Prabhupada in all circumstances and justifies these teachings. Another call has just come in. We have uh, one minute left. That's 60 seconds to order your copy before the break. If you want to get in on the first round, and we can't guarantee that there will be books left, there was only a uh, limited amount printed. They're the only ones on the continent of the United States. Two copies. One copy from Ramananda. One copy, Saka for, Prabhu. One copy for Pratibha Mataji. If, in case you Pratibha don't have Mataji, it. she wants to be on the list. Prashant, one copy. With the beautiful, pardon me? And this is... Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> This is the order from Saudi Arabia. From Monday. Saudi Arabia. Now they're coming to orders. We want some from Iraq also. <laughs> Let's get the Saudis in here. From Saudi Arabia. A Vijay, one copy. A two copies here. For Shri Kumar. Others from other countries, please call in. Represent your continent. We want, we want to hear from Asia. Australia. Australia, we'd like to hear from. Let's... And Antarctic, let's get a book. Would, would Jiva Goswami have ever imagined how these books would go out to various countries around the world? Would he imagine there would be a Silicon Valley and that we'd be sitting here today having a seminar based on his books? Uh, how, how would that affect the heart of such a, uh, a pure a devotee of Lord Chaitanya to see all of us here gathered today? and to, to propagate his books all over the world for the sake of sh uh, spreading Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. This is a direct connection to the author himself on a very deeply spiritual level, even if you keep this book in your house and you just respect it, you'll make great advancement in devotional life. More. Divyanga Lalita Devi Dasi from Omaha would like to Jai, hear Divyanga Lalita Devi Dasi from Omaha, Nebraska. Let's hear from <laughs> Nebraska, everybody. Come on. <laughs> Our Nilesh Prabhu wants to have a copy. Nilesh Vaghela Prabhu. Nilesh. Thank and, you, Nilesh. And Lokal Dax Prabhu bumped up his order to two copies. From yes, bump up those orders, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> 30 um, seconds left. Yeah. Sushil Prabhu says one more copy. Now we are in the bumping up round. Okay, bumping up. <laughs> <laughs> Sushil Prabhu. 15 seconds. Yes. Three Shab is just ordered. Waiting for the last 10 seconds. Yes. Five, four, three, two, one. For